Hello, good evening. Um, some of the, 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 the gentleman over here, Lou, was just pointing out that some of my slides have a lot of words. And so if you want to see the words, you're going to need to scoot up. So if you'd like to, like to scoot up, we'd love it if you did. But if, if you're comfortable where you are, that's fine. Um, so my name is Nathan Andrews. Uh, I uh, am here with some of our friends. These, these, I'm going to introduce these guys to you a little later. And that will be the, actually the best part of the presentation. And uh, we're from a retreat center and spiritual community on the North Coast. And I think I have a picture of that right here. Oh, this is our, our booth. We're in the far corner of the exhibition hall. It's called Original Design Creative Encounters. And uh, I'm going to be sharing with you what, what we do and, and what's our thinking and beliefs behind this Original Design Creative Encounter. Um, we also do healing. And uh, this, this is actually from a few years ago. And uh, this is a young guy, the guy with the, the aura badge. Um, Nathan, can I, can I get a pause for about 10 seconds? Sure. I was trying something that I thought could improve my DVD sound, but it's not even the right here. Thanks, no problem. So we also do uh, healing work in our booth, and we've seen some really exciting, dramatic things happen in years past. We're just getting started this year. Um, so come around for that as well. Uh, but I'm not gonna be talking about that much uh, this evening. Um, this is a, a sunrise picture uh, where we are. Our place was a hippie commune, and uh, there was a, a very powerful spiritual transformation that took place in the commune. and. Uh, and since then, it's been a number of different things, and we're there now. And uh, one of the things we do is, is uh, training young people, uh, uh, personal formation uh, for service. And we've, we send teams all over the world, um, and both short-term and long-term. And uh, so that's, that's who we are. Um, some of the people that I'm going to introduce to you in a minute are uh, actually students in our supernatural school that's going on right now. Uh, so... I'd like to just uh, have an invocation, if you don't mind, and uh, I just want to just invite the spirit of creation who brooded over the formless void to bring order and chaos. I'm sorry, I'm misreading this. <laughs> I'm going to start again. Eternal spirit of creation who brooded over the formless void to bring order to chaos, we invite you to manifest your presence here today. Creative word who spoke worlds into existence speak into our lives today so I want to just tell a little story um, when I first moved to California about 15 years ago I'd been living in Central Asia for uh, 14 years and then I spent a year in, in Colorado with my family and before we uh, we came and, and took over uh, the the retreat center where I am now and when I learned, when I realized we were going to be moving to California, the thought that came to mind was, maybe I'll get to sail now. This had been a dream I'd had for many years, I, is to learn to sail, to have my own sailboat. And so I started lurking online, just thinking I was shopping, and uh, I, fell in, I fell into a sailboat. I, there, there was one on eBay, and I saw it, and I thought, oh, I can't pass this one up. And, and I actually knew something about this boat. Um, this this kind of boat I'd done some research and uh, it was a very special boat uh, it's uh, a number of them had circumnavigated sailed all the way around the world one crazy individual actually took this boat and circ single handedly circumnavigated North and South America he went out Chesapeake Bay over the top of North America because you can do that now with the, the climate change down around Alaska all the way down the west coast of Canada United States all the way around South America, Cape Horn, all the way back up and sailed back into uh, Chesapeake Bay nonstop. He literally never uh, set, never uh, went into a port. And he did that in this boat. So I knew something about this boat and I saw it about to sell on eBay and I called up my lovely wife Cindy, who's over here, she was out of town at the time, and she agreed I could make my bid and I did it. And so a few days later, we live about 
three and a half hours or so north of Golden Gate Bridge. A few days later, the, my first opportunity, I've got my, uh, I've got my older, my teenage daughter and my little three-year-old boy. Uh, this is a picture of him here when he's a little older. And uh, he's a, a young man now. He's uh, 18 years old, living in, in L.A., uh, uh, doing some studies. So the, with my kids in the car, we went down there. We got off a little late. So by the time we got there, it was getting dark. It was, you know, the sun was setting, and it was kind of that damp San Francisco, right on the bay kind of weather. And, and the, there wasn't good light. But as I approached the boat, even in bad light, I could see this thing is not in good repair. Yeah, there were parts of it that were hanging off of it. The cushions had been left out in the weather. Uh, when we got inside, went down inside the boat, it smelled really bad. No, I, I don't mean to just smell like a boat. It smelled bad. And uh, there was spilled food. There was oily water in the build. It was, it was in bad, a bad situation. And, uh, and so as I'm looking at this, trying to get my bearings, um, my little boy who's now three and a half, four hours away from his mother, um, and is starting to get antsy and fidgety, and he's realizing that this boat is not going to allow him to access pirates, and he's greatly disappointed. And so he, he's like fidgeting, and I've got to do something. So I pull out my, my cell phone, I dial his mother, and I said, uh, here, talk to your mom. And out of his mouth, the first words is this, this horrible, tone of disappointment and complaint he says mom dad's boat is yucky <laughs> and it was it was yucky um, but the thing was I was looking at it and definitely realizing I had a lot more work cut out for me than I had realized but I was not sorry I bought the boat and the reason was I knew the design of this boat and I know that I knew something about the designer. It was a Swedish boat, and it was designed by a, a, a naval designer named Per Brohal. I knew what this boat was capable of. I had seen what this boat looked like when it's fully restored, and I was I knew the boat based on its original design, and I was looking at this boat based on its restoration and what it was capable of. And so these pictures are actually a few years later. And there's my my son at the tiller. Um, on Clear Lake and that's where the the boat is right now actually and I've since then sailed it in San Diego and uh, in various places in California off the coast where we live now as well so I want to just pause here and give you my presuppositions presupposition is a big word it's kind of a philosophical word all it means is what I what these are my basic assumptions uh, one of my professors used to call this the basement of reality we all have presuppositions. Um, you can kind of think, if you remember your, your uh, high school uh, or whenever you took uh, your geometry, um, your axioms from geometry. So your axioms, you can't prove axioms, okay? But your axioms allow you to prove other things. And the axioms are validated or proven by what they allow you to prove. Does that make sense? So presuppositions are the most basic assumptions about life, the universe, and everything. Okay, um, and so I'm just going to be honest with you about my presuppositions because if somebody says they don't have any presuppositions, um, either they're just not aware of them, that a lot, a lot of people aren't aware that they have presuppositions, and that actually gives those presuppositions more power over you. If you're not aware of what they are, they actually control your thinking and your outlook and control what you're able to see and not see more. Um, some people, when they say I don't have any presuppositions, it's because they're not being honest. They don't want to admit to you. So I'm going to admit to you what my presuppositions are. Um, here's the two most basic presuppositions. An uncreated creator is the origin and sustainer of all that exists. Okay, that's my most basic assumption. And, and I could go into the alternatives. There's actually only, there's, there's really not a lot of, al there's a, a large amount of alternatives to that presupposition. There is other presuppositions that would contradict that. But this is my presupposition, okay? Um, flowing from that, you are a created creator the workmanship of the uncreated creator. Okay, now this is really important to understanding who we are. And this is where we've really gotten off track, is not understanding that we are created, fine, in other words, we have a beginning, um, we're finite, but we are created creators. Okay, um, and we've gotten into all kinds of trouble not understanding that, um, because as we've grown in our understanding of the world we live in, 
this, this incredibly complex chain of cause and effect, we have gotten caught up in that machine, in that predictability, that measurability of that. We believe, we have come to believe that we are part of that cause and effect chain. And I'm going to submit to you that we're not. Now, we are. We have a body. If I drop you from an airplane, you're going to obey the laws of physics, okay? Um, but we are more than that. We are created creators. Um, we are capable of uncaused action. So I'm going to, I want to read you a poem here. I hope you can see it. Um, but let me, I'll read it to you. And I want you to guess. I'm going to take guesses on who wrote it, okay? And if you've heard me give this lecture before, you're not allowed to say. Um, Dear sir, I said, although now long estranged, man is not wholly lost nor wholly changed. Now this is an older poem, so I apologize for the, the, the pronouns, okay? Man meaning mankind. Man is not wholly lost nor wholly changed. Disgraced he may be, yet is not dethroned and keeps the rags of lordship once he owned. Man, the sub-creator, the refracted light, through whom is splintered from a single white to many hues and endlessly combined in living shapes that move from mind to mind. Though all the crannies of the world we filled with elves and goblins, though we dared to build gods in their houses out of dark and light, and sowed the seed of dragons, twas our right, used or misused, that right has not decayed. We make still by the law in which we are made. Any guesses on who wrote that? There's some clues in it. Some people, sometimes some pe people have guessed correctly. Any guesses on the, the poet that wrote that, the writer? Don't be shy. No, not Shakespeare. Much, much more recent than that. Yes. J.R.R. Tolkien. Okay, the elves and the goblins were a, a clue there. Now this poem appears in an essay he wrote called On Fairy Stories. On Fairy Stories. And in it, he is defending the, the artistic validity of fantasy literature, which at the time was considered escape literature. And it was, it was, it was thought, this is just, that's, it's just escape literature. Um, and it, it, it's not valid. And they just kind of uh, wrote it off as not really worthy. In fact, a lot of his colleagues at Oxford thought it was just not worthy of him, what he was doing there, not realizing he was probably, in my book, uh, uh, writing the, the, the one, of the, one of the, I would give it my vote as the greatest literary achievement of the 20th century. It's just amazing. And uh, so, and it's, if nothing else, even if you disagree that it's gr a great masterpiece, everybody loves it. It's a lot of fun, okay? Um, so this is J.R.R. Tolkien. And J.R. Tolkien here, in, in, and in the essay Fairy Stories, on Fairy Stories, he tells us why he created Middle Earth. And he develops his whole philosophy of, of literary creation. And it's that we are sub-creators. He uses that word, sub-creators. And he says, writing fantasy is actually not the lowest form of literature. It's actually the highest because it's m the most complete expression of sub-creation because you're actually creating worlds that don't exist and then putting peoples and uh, characters into them and, and, and allowing those, them to live their lives. And I, I don't know if you're aware, he didn't just write the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He actually wrote languages and histories and mythologies and all kinds of things that, that went with that and, and went behind that. But that was, what, that was his whole philosophy that allowed him to do this incredibly creative work was that he believed that he was a, truly a creator and that he and that it, it, he that was part of his design and part of a like a, I would call it his vocation a calling for him to do that now when we talk about creativity we we usually mean artistic creation and that is huge that's wonderful um, but creativity is much more than that Okay, you are a creative being if you've never written a poem or painted a picture or written a song or anything like picked up an instrument. Creativity is at the, ba at the basis of our creativity is the ability to produce uncaused action. And that's what we can do. Um, the incredible uh, self-help management leadership book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, starts there. He says between the between the the cause and effect, okay, between the stimulus and the response, there's always a gap. That's, his, that's one of his starting points. 
Um, and, and so creativity can be expressed in the business realm, can be expressed in the home, it can be expressed, it's, it is expressed in relationships, it's expressed in, in sacrificial choices that we make. All of that is, is who is expressing our creativity. Where are we at with time? So J.R. Tolkien. Um, so I'm gonna give you some more, uh, so what's it that? Okay. Um, so flowing from those two presuppositions that an uncreator, uncreated creator is the ground of all being and that we are created creators, okay? Um, this means you have a kinship with creation. You are part of creation, okay? You have a physical body. We inhabit the physical realm, okay? Um, we, are, uh, we are creatures and we have kinship with creation. And so that's why scientific exploration is, is rewarding and is valuable. Um, that's why intellectual exploration, philosophical, rational engagement is, is valid. It's important. It's not a waste of time because we are inhabiting the, the physical realm. Okay? But we also have a kinship with the creator. We, are, we don't only have kinship with creation. We have kinship with the creator. Okay? So this means that spiritual exploration, heart response, is, is valuable and needed. Okay? And these two realms are distinct. And they, they have overlap. They, they, they intersect. But they're, they're actually distinct. Another thing that flows from this is the creator is a spirit. I think every, everybody knows that. And you are a creative spirit. Okay, so I am not only a body. I don't just have a body, I am a body. Okay, I also don't just have a spirit, I am a spirit. And so we are interdimensional beings. We inhabit two dimensions, okay? So I am here, I'm really here, and this is real. This is not an illusion, okay? And I'm inhabiting it but I'm also inhabiting the spirit realm, okay? And my spirit man is inhabiting that spirit realm. Now, we're in, especially in, in the Western world, our spirit man, our spirit being, our spirit self, has atrophied. And sometimes we're not even aware of its capabilities. Um, we're not even aware of, of messages and, and, and revelation, understanding our spirit man it has access to. Um, because we, we are so grounded, so present in the physical realm. Some of you have seen, seen that animated movie where uh, hu human civilization is advanced and is so technologically advanced that they, they don't even have to walk anymore. They have wheelchairs. It's, an an it's such a kid's animated movie. But they're in, they have these conveyances and they don't have to even use their limbs or their legs. And so when it comes time they tr have to try to walk or, or move about, they can't do it because they're just these blimpy people. Now they haven't, they're, they're still homo sapiens, they're still human beings, they have all the capabilities, but they've atrophied because they haven't used all of those cap capabilities. They're, they're no longer even able, to, they're no longer available to them. And so uh, we are spiritual beings and uh, the just like the creator, which means we can communicate with the creator, spirit to spirit. Okay, the creator is good and you are wonderfully created for good. Okay, I love this, uh, that, 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 those letters there that you probably can't see very well, and those are Greek letters, and that's the word poema. Um, and it comes from uh, an, an, an ancient text, it's, it's actually St. Peter writes, and he speaks to, to those early primitive disciples, and he says, you are God's poema. And, the, and it's translated workmanship, which sounds very kind of me mechanistic, right? That we're, he, he made us, and so yeah, it's kind of like you'd you know, hammer together a few boards and make something, okay? But the word is poema. It's, it's an artistic masterpiece. So we are that masterpiece. Um, it's a thing of beauty, a thing of, of complexity and beauty. So, and this also flows from those first two presuppositions. The universe is ultimately personal. The universe is not ultimately impersonal. Now, there are impersonal elements. If you try to have a relationship with this chair, it's not going to be particularly fulfilling. Okay, so, th so there are impersonal elements to creation. But ultimately, the universe is personal in the person of the creator. Now, let me just say something here. The creator is, uh, we could say, transpersonal. He's more than personal. He transcends male and female. He transcends uh, uh, 
individuality itself, okay? But sometimes when we try to imagine what is more than personal, what we actually picture in our minds is impersonal because we can't picture it. And so instead of el stretching ourselves to the, the suprapersonal, we go down to impersonal, okay? The creator is personal. He creates. He does new things. And, and I hope my, my pronouns don't offend you. The creator transcends male, female, and even individuality itself, okay? And that means relationship is possible. That means human relationship with other creative beings, uh, creative human beings is possible and meaningful, okay? It's not just chemical. It's not just, uh, it's, no, it's nothing like that. It is meaningful. It is, it is creative. It's a crea creative engagement with another creative being. Okay, before I go on much longer, I want to just demonstrate some of what we do in our booth, um, which is we simply ask the creator to speak about his creation. Um, it's a way of just understanding who we are. And, and, and so we can do this for ourselves, but we, we find that if we sit together and do it for someone else, two people together coming into agreement and just simply asking the creator, say, what is Bob's, this person in front of me, what is Bob's original design? What do you want to say about it? Um, so I'd like them to come up and do that. I've, I've, a few of them I've invited to come, come on up. Now, some of these are uh, students in this school. Uh, it's, it's actually a long seminar, a nine-week sem seminar. And some of them actually are staff that have been walking with us for a while. And I'm not even going to tell you which ones are which. Um, but you guys, uh, I've told them beforehand, and they've been kind of looking around and, and maybe see, saw some of you who came in. And so I've asked them to just, just open up their, their hearts and their spirits and just speak out what they're, what they're seeing. Um, sir in the back, you got the vest on. What's your name? Johnson. Okay. Um, I was hearing some things and I was seeing some things. Um, and so I just want to suggest this to you and ask you some questions. Um, but I was hearing this phrase, the power of sound. Uh, do you happen to do anything with like music or sound therapy or anything like that? No. Okay. <laughs> just curious. Um, so I, I kind of saw you, uh, the power of sound, the power of your voice. Um, and I don't know if you've noticed that when you're talking to people or when you're in conversation with people, you can actually see changes in emotions. Like maybe they're upset and maybe they come peaceful or maybe uh, uh, you're talking to someone who's sad or depressed and they start to become more joyful. Does that resonate? Does that sound about right? Okay. So I, I just want to encourage you with that. The power of your voice, the power of sound is kind of on your life and I feel like you can influence uh, people for the better and and that's why I was kind of getting that phrase sound therapy like it's it's for something it's it's powerful it's actually affecting change in people's lives so I just want to encourage you with that <laughs> uh, can I ask for your name yes DN okay uh, I'm Michael so, Deanne, uh, the word that I am just hearing over and over about you is wonder. <clears throat> and uh, with that, I feel like, and I, I want to submit this to you, <laughs> I'm still practicing listening, um, is that you have a very uh, adventurous spirit. And I see you almost helping people, like proverbially, kind of come out of the nest and kind of help them, almost like pushing little chicks out, like when it's the right time and helping them fly. And the image I'm getting is a bunch of little bunch of birds just flying. And I see you like re releasing freedom in a way that's actually instructive. Like, do you do teaching at all? I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, wow. That's really cool. Um, do you have a passion for teaching at all? Oh, beautiful. Okay, see, oh, for context here, uh, I had absolutely nothing until I stood up here. And so I'm in a place where this is still pretty uncomfortable for me. So just to, just to invite you guys in on my process, I'm pretty nervous, but like this is an interesting experience, right? So I'm, I'm as surprised as you are. Okay, so I want to go uh, a, a little bit further with this. Um, 
have you been interested in some kind of like painting or art therapy? Just completely trying this out on you. You don't feel like you have to take it. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, and faces, right? That's beautiful. I feel like there's something very healing in that, in that you get to capture somebody's face, right? And it's a different perspective, and you're putting it onto canvas. That's really beautiful. Um, yeah, so um, anyways, I could keep going and going and going and going. I think that the creator has a bunch of things to say. Um, I'm not teaching. I'm just giving them a demonstration. Um, yeah, so wanted to, yeah, submit that to you. So I actually got a word for you as well, Deanne. Um, as soon as I saw you, I just kind of got a picture of a little hummingbird floating around you. I don't know if hummingbirds mean anything to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I was kind of sensing was um, that they're there to comfort you, um, they're there to remind you, and um, they also represent lightheartedness and um, joy and playfulness. Um, and I feel like those are qualities that you also have that um, the Creator has placed inside of you. Um, so not only are they there um, to comfort you and to remind you of your family, but also um, to kind of remind you of who you are and who you truly are inside. Um, so I just wanted to encourage you with that. You're full of joy and lightness, and um, you definitely give that to other people around you. Kind of like when you see a hummingbird, everybody gets so excited, and like it's so joyful and peaceful, and um, that is just what you bring to people when you encounter them. So, yeah. Uh, the man in the white shirt, what is your name? David, um, do you like animals by chance? Um, so what I got for you um, is uh, that, like a cheetah, um, you're running hard after searching for stuff, um, searching for things. But I feel like um, you uh, you might be interested in leadership. Um, are you interested in any leadership roles or anything like that? Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So I feel like um, the Creator, the Holy Spirit, wants to do more with that, um, and yeah, He just wants to give you more of that um, and the desires of your heart. And I had one other thing. Um, kind of thing. Yeah, he, he he wants you to know that you have a voice um, and leadership and other things that you have a, a voice that He wants you to use. All right, I have a word for um, the man kind of in the middle with the blue shirt and the long sleeve black shirt underneath. Yes, what is your name? Daniel? Daniel? Awesome. So uh, I have a word that I'd like to submit to you. I got an image of a frog. And so I was asking the creator, I was like, what does that mean? What does the frog represent? Um, and I felt like the creator was saying that giving me the idea of leapfrogging, that you're a learner and that you almost leapfrog off of uh, maybe like mentor figures who went before you or even like uh, parents, relatives, and that you're constantly leapfrogging on the backs and going higher and higher and learning more and more. And you just have this, this hunger and this thirst to learn more. And then I got an image of um, you kind of, you know, leapfrogging over over the other frogs and then at one point this lily pad just came underneath you and just whoop, and just like you just went up just this rapid acceleration of um enlightenment and knowledge and so i feel like the creator really wants to bring you into that just season of just rapid um growth and learning and yeah revelation awesome <laughs> What's your name here in the front, ma'am? Juanita? Oh, that's a nice name. Um, do you have any kids, Juanita? I just hear so strongly, you're a really good mom. <laughs> and I think you have like a particular, uh, like it's a normal human need to want connection and stuff, but I think for you it's particularly strong. 
um, and I just sense that like this drawing of drawing in of people and I just get like this sense of like when you walk into like a really warm family home and it's like let's eat and like everyone laughing around the table like I feel like you create spaces like that and you're like not even just to your own kids but you're a really good mom and like you nurture and mother people around you and that's such a gift and it's so beautiful and I feel specifically there may have been um relationships in your life that feel distant right now um, of people that you miss and love dearly and it just feels a little bit distant and I feel like the creators like I'm gonna fix that I'm gonna restore that because that's the longing of the creator's heart as well to have those connections and to bring your family in and so yeah I bless you with the restoration of connections Um, woman kind of in the cream colored sweater in the back, you're looking down <laughs> at your, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I'm sorry. What is your name? What was your name? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I just saw, um, a picture of a daisy, like in a field. And, um, I don't know if they mean anything to you if you like flowers um, but I just feel like the creator was saying that you are worthy of being admired and worthy of being nurtured um, yeah not just for somebody or anybody to come in and like pick the flowers and take them and you know after you pick them they kind of die but um, yeah you're worthy of just being tended to and cared for and just being looked at like the way he looks at you is just like a flower in a field he doesn't want to interrupt you or you know rip out your roots or anything he just wants to water you and um, to nurture you and just to behold your beauty um, because he created you beautifully and wonderfully yeah Um, that I wasn't sensing that just kind of um, that's how I feel um, that our how he sees you um. oh wow <laughs> okay that's crazy yeah yeah I specifically saw a daisy it was very particular wow <laughs> awesome I'm guessing, I'm guessing some of them have things on their hearts, so if they have more things they're wanting to say, it's just a time constraint. So feel free to pursue people and, and share with them. And anybody that didn't get one, feel free to come to our booth, booth, the Original Design Creative Encounters booth, and we will sit with you personally and, and listen and, and speak out what we get and submit it to you. Okay, I've got 10 minutes left or so. So tell me when I've, I've got five minutes left. Oh, we're going to skip through. The, oh, this is hard. Okay. This is my friend Sean. He's a talented musician, and uh, he's playing a good all guitar. This is another friend of mine, Dame James, and I actually introduced these two to, to each other. Uh, Sean came and visited at our center. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm moving too fast. Okay. And uh, he's a friend of mine, and... Uh, this is James, actually a closer friend of mine. He lives near us, and uh, and he is a, he he designs good all gu designed and makes good all guitars. They're one of the finest handmade guitar acoustic guitars in the world, and it's probably like if you were going to name what's the best acoustic guitar in the world, you'd probably have to come up with like a, a short list of five, and he his would definitely be part of it. And so I introduced them. He actually designed a guitar for Sean. And, uh, and Sean commissioned a guitar, and it was worth many thousands of dollars, uh, made, just crafted to, to suit his playing style. They even chose wood that had a, a symbolic and metaphorical and spiritual sim significance to Sean. And uh, it was just a beautiful instrument that he played. And I ran into him later at a concert in Chico, California. And I said, oh, I noticed you're still playing your good old guitar. And he... Uh, told me this story. He said, yeah. He said, but um, I was on a tour, and I was coming off tour, and I always take it in a gig bag, which is like a little soft bag, because I don't want to 
put in, I don't want to surrender it to the, the luggage monkeys, um, the luggage gorillas to abuse it. And so I, 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 I always carry it on the plane, but then I have to have it in a, in a soft bag. And he says, I was, my wife picked me up from the airport, and he lives in Pennsylvania, at least at that time he did. And it was an, uh, an especially cold uh, uh, time. There was a really, really cold, cold snap. And he put it in the back of his hatchback. And so what it, he didn't realize what was happening is there was, the heat was at the front of the car. There was no heat in the back of the car. The, the, it was getting well below, the, the guitar itself went well below freezing. And then when he got, off, got out, um, she didn't realize it was there, opened the hatchback, and it just tumbled out onto the hard, cold ground and just shattered it. Uh, he reported it to the insurance company. Of course, you had an instrument like that would be insured. They, they just they said, we're, we're gonna, it's a total write-off. We're just gonna, gonna give it to you. So, but he contacted James. He contacted the maker, the creator, and he said, is there any hope for my guitar? And he, yeah, this was like one of the pictures he said. It was, it's worse than this picture makes it look. And so James said, well, I don't know. Send it to me, and we'll take a look. And so he did, and what Sean said is when that guitar came back to him, I was looking at the car, and I said, I can't believe it. I said, this is the guitar? And he said, yeah, yeah. It, you literally could not see a mark on it. And he says, here's the crazy thing. He said, I was just with another friend of mine, a, a nationally known musician, and he was playing, playing this guitar, and he said, Sean, I think this is the best guitar I have ever played. He said, he said, it sound, and, and then Sean told me, he said, it sounds better now than it did before it broke. <laughs> okay? So I want to offer that to you as a parable, okay? Because we all have processes in our life. We all have things that we've gone through um, that have damaged us. We've been talking about original design, but of course, we're not in original uh, condition, like my boat. My boat was yucky. This is a better, uh, a better metaphor, though, because James is a craftsman, and I'm not a boat. I, I fixed up my boat, but I'm not a craftsman. But James was, and he completely restored that guitar. Um, so I want to submit to you that the maker understands what he has made. And that's important. He understands our original design. But more than that, the creator values his creation. You know, the, the insurance company just wrote it off. What, uh, uh, when it's totaled, what that means is a car that's totaled or something, uh, an instrument that's totaled, it means it's going to cost more to fix it than that, that item is worth, right? But that's not how, how James relates to his, his, these instruments that he creates. He handcrafts them. He and his, all of his guitars are made by he and his son. And so he, he valued it in a different way. He knew, he knew how to restore it, and he had a heart to restore it, okay? Um, and the craftsman can fully restore his own workmanship. And so it's important for us to know our original design. Okay, and there's lots of ways we can start that journey. I'm just gonna pop through a couple of them. Profiles, personality tests, like Myers-Briggs or Strength Finders or DISC. Um, those are valid, some of those work for me, some of them don't. Um, they're worth doing. You can discover some of your strengths and weaknesses. Your personal history, just thoughtfully going back through your history um, somebody took a full day with me one time and led me through a process to think about, about everything I had achieved in life that I felt good about and how I had done it, and then allowed that to point me in a direction of how I should be uh, 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 approaching my future. That's, that's a helpful thing to do. Your dreams. Um, when a young, I have a lot of young people that we're mentoring, and they come to me and they say, I don't know what's next. Young people tend to think about their lives in six-month increments, you know. I've got these dreams and these aspirations and fire in the belly, and what am I going to, you know. And I, I always start with them, not by saying, what does the creator want you to do? The first thing I say is, what do you want to do? What, what, what's your dream? What, 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 what do you enjoy doing? Um, now, it's important that I say, not what would you like to be known for having done. Okay, because that's, that's, that's a lie. That, that's something that gets put on top of us. I, I want to be famous for this. No, what do you actually enjoy doing? Okay, and because what, you're good, what you enjoy doing is usually what you're good at. What you're good at is a clue, at least a clue to your, who you were, how you were designed and what you were called, what you were designed to do. That's what the word vocation means. It means calling. Um, and it's connected with your design. So those are all good things. The one thing we never do, and this is what we were doing just here, and this is what we do in our booth, if you come and sit with us, just take, take a few minutes to sit with us, is consult the designer about your original design. Um, you can do that. And what we find is that he likes talking about it. 
it's it's easy. We, we, we're not, we don't consider ourselves psychics. We're not trying to read your psyche. Um, it's actually easier than that. We're asking the creator to talk about his creation, and he enjoys doing that. Okay? So what we're not doing, we're not psychics. I just said that. We're not, that psyche means soul. We're not trying to read your soul. Um, it's not exhaustive. We don't claim that this is a complete picture of you. We're not going to sum you up and say this is who you are in total. It, this is what you need. This is something the Creator knows you need at this point in your journey. Okay? And we're not predicting fixed fates. We're empowering you to fulfill the glorious possible of your destiny. Okay? So destiny, sometimes we think of it in, in fatalistic terms. This is a, I've got to get to this point by this date, and if I don't, I've missed it. No, no, your design is the key to your destiny. Your destiny is fully living out of and living up to who you've been created to be. And, and that's what this is about. Um, I, I actually caution people to beware of uh, any kind of determinism. The, 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 what's prevalent nowadays is scientific determinism. I started with that, this whole uh, scientific worldview that says you're just mo matter in motion and if we just could, could boil down all the chemicals and, and all the influences in your life of nurture and nature, then we could predict exactly what you're going to do next. It's a fallacy. It's not true. Okay, um, that's a, it's a form of determinism. There's been religious determinism, predestination, things like that. Uh, gismet, uh, that this idea that there's there's a fixed fate out there, and fatal any kind of spiritual fatalism. That's that's not what we're talking about. We live in an open universe. The Creator is still creating, and you, and I, and and all of these creative beings are creating. It's not a it's not a a closed universe. Okay. Uh, we said that we're not creating predicting fixed fates, we're empowering you to fulfill your destiny the glorious possible. Okay. Um, why, why is it repeating that? Okay. Um, we said we're not infallible, and it's not going to be negative. You noticed all of these things were positive. Now, at one time, we were one time just out in, on the street where we live, and we were kind of kind of had a little booth, and we were offering this to anybody that wanted to, to try it. And, one, and we, I said, you know, don't worry, it's going to be positive. And this guy said, oh, well, then I don't want it. I want it to be true. And, he, you know, I understood where he's coming from. He said, no, I want it to be true. I want it to be right. And I want to submit to you that we think about the positive and the negative wrong. And I'm going to close with this. So this is how we tend to think. The negative, and we all know there's good and bad, there's stuff that's, that's positive, there's negative in, in all of our lives, okay? And so we tend to think the negative is who I, who I actually am, and the positive is who I wish I could be. Someday, maybe I'll be that someday, okay? I want to, I, I want to su uh, suggest that you flip it around, okay? Um, think of the positive is who you are fundamentally, who you were created to be. That is who you are. Okay? The negative is what has come against that, how that design has been opposed. Because the fact is, there's all kinds of forces trying to squeeze you into other molds. Okay? And some of those things, we even come into agreement with them and align with them and participate in those things that distort who we are and damage who we are. Sometimes it's an injustice from the outside. Sometimes we actually agree and participate with it. Um, for most of us, it's some combination of the both, of both of those, those things. And so I just want to suggest to you uh, what my daughter said to me. I was coming here, and I said, oh, man, I'm a little nervous about this. And she said, you're an apple tree, Dad. <laughs> and she was quoting me, and the illustration I often use is that uh, an apple tree is an apple tree, whether or not it's growing, it has apples hanging on the branches at the moment. Okay? There can be a lot of reasons why that apple tree at this moment isn't bearing apples. It might just not just be the time. It may just be, hey, you're, you're in development, you're in process. They're going to come in, in season, those apples will come. It might be there's something wrong with the soil and we need to, to nourish the soil. This apple tree hasn't been nourished like it needs to be or cared for. Maybe, it's, maybe there are animals that are, that are damaging. We had an, a bear climb up one of our apple trees and break off branches. Um, but it's still an apple tree, whether or not it's got apples hanging on it. And so I encourage you to see yourself based on who you are and, and evaluate that based on who the Creator says you are. And uh, you can do that for yourself. I encourage you, start asking. Just in a quiet moment, walk out under the stars and just say, who am I? Who have you created me to be? Show me something about that. And then give him time to do it. And come sit in the... Come sit in the booth with us, and we'll help you with that, too. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming and being here.